first of all, that the only way to talk about hope today, and I don't think hope is enough. I think hope is a start. If you just get to hope and you get stuck there, you don't take any action. It takes certainty for people to take action. And I think we want to talk a little bit about ways we as leaders can induce that, not only in ourselves, so we lead by example, solve some of our own challenges, so that we can also help other people do the same. Who's interested in that? Just out of curiosity there. Good. Fantastic. And uh, I'd say Ramadan Mubarak, first of all, for those in the room from there, and happy Passover shortly, happy Easter for others. If we want to have some hope, we can look at the people of the book. All of them are celebrating things in the next week or so. And for thousands of years, they've helped to guide. They're not the only religions in the world, but they've given us principles, universal principles that have guided human behavior and helped us make it through wars, make it through pandemics, make it through recessions and depressions. I mean, you don't have to worry about hope. All you have to do is look at the pattern of humanity and you can have some certainty. That's a very different world than just hoping, in my opinion. But I hope that I can do something of real value for you here in this short period of time because my challenge is I'm excited to be here. It's a privilege to be here. But the shortest thing I usually do is 50 hours, literally, five zero. So sit back and relax. <laughs> I usually do four days of immersion. It's not because I like to speak. Uh, it's because I, uh, my bias is to action. If you just learn something, if you let your learning lead to knowledge, you become a fool. If your learning leads to action, you can create real change. And my hope is, out of all these brilliant minds here and all the brilliant discussions, that you all are going to leave here with some specific actions that you think are important for you to take, because that's the only way the world changes. Knowledge is not power. We all know that. Knowledge is trumped by action, by execution every day of the week. So that's really my focus. So let's we'll see what I can do here in the short time here to try and support you in this endeavor, if I may. Um, so let's talk about this just for a second, this idea of hope. We, as human beings, are driven, we think, by our minds. But in reality, if you study humanity, it's all emotion. We are a culture, we are a group of people that have a herd mentality, and if we are challenged enough, and if we induce that deep emotion called fear or greed, human beings make massive actions, and they lead others sometimes to do things that don't really serve them. So when I think about human beings, I think about what is the most powerful force in the universe, or at least on this planet, let's just not exaggerate, and that would be human emotion. Because what creates a war? It's not intellect that creates war. It's human emotion. What creates peace? When people exhaust that feeling of war and they're tired of it. The Abraham Accords maybe are a beautiful reflection of that. Maybe we're beginning to be tired of what we've gone through for so long. Maybe it's time for something new and people are beginning to see that. And there's new leadership that has new views, new beliefs, new ways of looking at life. Some of them are not colored by the past. You got a leader in Saudi Arabia, I was just there for four days, who's absolutely incredibly brilliant. He's created a vision for this country and seen more change in four years than they've had in 70 years. Well, part of that is because he wasn't alive in 1979 when his country was attacked. 70% of the population wasn't. So sometimes change happens because of generational shifts, but the emotion is the most important thing. It's what got you married, it's what got you children, it's what gets you divorced, it's what makes you start a business, it's really the driver behind everything. And yet, most of us are not that good at it. Technology is exploding, and we all know what's happening with AI, but our emotional development may be not quite as fast. That might be the biggest challenge we have to face. So when I think about human emotion and behavior and how to, how to be a leader, what is a leader? A leader is a person of influence, true? Your job as a leader is to influence. You only solve problems, if you only solve it by yourself, you don't need an organization. But if it's a big enough problem, we have to organize, we have to be together, you have to have influence. You have to be able to bring a vision. You've got to influence the thoughts, the feelings, the emotions, and the actions of another human being. To do that, we might have to start with ourselves as well. And if we do that, we can look at a ladder of emotions where maybe the lowest ladder is that survival section that every one of us have in our brains. We all have a two million year old brain and it's wired for fear. Because it's a survival instinct. Fear tells us this is something we gotta pay attention to, we gotta fight it, or we got to flight from it or freeze and hope it doesn't notice. And there's no saber-toothed tiger anymore for us to be diving from, so now people worry about what people say in social media or how much money they have, even though they live, most people, in countries where there's great opportunity and where it might be hard not to survive. Maybe not have a great quality of life, but not to survive. Some places that's obviously very different. And so if you look at it and say fear is that base emotion, what does fear lead to? Usually one of two things. It either goes internal and a person becomes depressed and overwhelmed or it becomes externalized in forms of anger, which we're seeing so much more around the world, certainly in this country. 
And anger is not a great emotion, but it might be better than depression because at least it creates change. It's not elegant change. It's not always the change that we want, but it's gonna make something move. How many of you can think of something in your life, I'm curious, where there was something you said you're gonna change, you said you're gonna make it happen, you promised yourself you're gonna do it, and you got right to the edge and pulled back, right to the edge and pulled back, and you're pissed off at yourself, and you did it several times. Who's done this before? I'm curious. Raise your hand if you would, say I. And I'm asking you to do that because if you sit passively and listen to me, research shows you'll remember less than 10% what I said, so I wasted your time and you did too. I don't wanna do that. But if you engage your body, your nervous system drives it a little deeper. So if you didn't raise your hand, you lie about other shit too, let's be honest, okay? So we've all done this. So and what is it that finally pushed you over the edge? Who's ever been in a relationship way too long? Who can relate to that? Say, ah, nice and loud there. Come on, let me hear you. Okay, why? Because you'd rather deal with the devil you know than the devil you don't know. It wasn't good for you, you stayed. Why did you stay? You stayed until one day you rationalized. It'll get better. It was better in the past. But what happens is there's a day where you go, it's been painful in the past, it's painful in the present, it can be painful in the future, I am out of here. Who's ever made such a decision, changed your life in some way, or say I? So the bottom line is that anger emotion can sometimes be useful if we can convert it into some positive action. If it's negative action, obviously it'd be very destructive, but it's gonna create change either way. So fear is the base emotion. So what's above that? Yes, hope is beautiful. When somebody is hopeful, what changes? Their emotion, it's a different emotion, but what changes when you start to have hope? There's an energy change, that's right. You go from it's impossible, you go from the anger, or you go from you know, feeling depressed or overwhelmed to it's possible. Hope means it's possible, and so it's a critical emotion. But if you stay on the ladder of human emotion and hope, you won't act. You'll be looking for someone to rescue you. You know, I can remember one time I we went down with a group of, you know, alpha males who are all part of the Hollywood industry and we went down the Colorado River and people weren't paying attention. I remember this guy was saying to us, the guy sat us all down and he said, you must participate in your own rescue because guys were doing stupid things and they thought someone was gonna sa save them. We gotta participate in our own rescue. And the bottom line is, in a hope, you don't do that quite as much. It's possible. It can lead to more, but not always. What leads to real action? Certainty. True? And where do we get certainty from when we're trying to do something that's never been done before? That's the challenge. The challenge for most people is they think of a big dream, a big goal, a big desire, a big change they want to make in their company, in their family, in the world. But then the problem is it's never been done before, so they're uncertain. And uncertainty slows action. Doesn't stop it completely, but it certainly slows it. So the question is, how do we increase it? Well, what's a step above hope would be certainty. One of those forms of certainty might be a thing called faith. Now, I don't mean just religious faith, I mean faith. Now, how do we use faith? Did anybody teach you to have faith? No, you were born with faith. Thank God, or you wouldn't be able to function. How many of you drove here at some point, either to the airport or someplace? How many were driving in a car to get here at some stage? Here, let's see a show of hands here, good. And so that means you were driving down the street probably where there was nothing but a yellow line dividing you from insane people. People, some of them are drunk, some of them are gonna fall asleep, some of them are texting, true or false? True or false? True. And every single day in every country in the world, in every city in the world, somebody gets killed by somebody who falls asleep, texts, is drunk, or something happens. Every single day. And the only thing saving your life is a dotted yellow line? No, no, no. How do you drive? Faith. Because the alternative is stay home and do nothing. We, we tried that during COVID. It didn't work too well. Right? destroyed a lot of people's psychology, emotion, and now momentum, as was described just a few moments ago, a very important thing was described by Ant just a few moments ago. Momentum is everything. So if we're, we have faith inside of us, then you gotta ask yourself, what's the difference between fear and faith? What would you say it is? I'm looking for a discussion, just not talking at you. <laughs> Anybody, what's the difference between fear and faith? What's that? Love, well that's beautiful, I like that. Someone else, what's the difference between fear and faith in your mind? What is that? A decision, mm, very nice, I agree with that. Here's what it is, think about fear and faith. They're both based on the future. You're not afraid of this moment, you're in this moment. You're afraid of what's coming. What are people afraid of? They're afraid of not getting what they want or losing what they have. Those are the two fears that most people have. Now what is fear? It's an imagination. You're imagining. Who's ever 
freaked yourself out, been worried about something that never happened. Who's done this before? Say, I. Good, no liars this time. Fantastic. Very good. <laughs> we've all done it, right? And we've done it many times, right? Sometimes who's done it about the same issue several times, even though you're smarter than that? Say, I, <laughs> right? So it's like, okay, I'm imagining the worst case scenario and it doesn't happen. And we've all heard the old phrase, right? A coward dies a thousand deaths, a courageous man or woman only once. Because when you imagine it, you feel like you're dying. You feel like you're going through all those problems. So when you have fear, it's imagination. When you have faith, it's also imagination. You don't know what the future is going to be. So how can you have certainty? Because the difference is fear is imagination undirected. It's like weeds. Fear is automatic. You don't have to work on fear. It's built into the nervous system. Consciousness raising allows us to move towards things called faith, where we direct consciously our imagination to the outcome we really want. And isn't that what all great leaders do? Think about it. In my own country here, and I know many of you are international audience, but I'm pretty, I can remember as a very child even, it's more mythology for me because I was so young, John F. Kennedy, and he had a vision. And he talked about his vision publicly. What did he do? He challenged Americans. Not what are you gonna get from us? What are you gonna give to America? But most importantly, he had vision. What did he say? We're, within a decade, we're gonna take a man and land him on the moon and bring him back to Earth safely. What did the people at NASA said? He's insane. He's insane. We do not have the ability to do that. We do not have the technology to do that. That's leadership. You decide what the vision is. And you don't worry that you don't have certainty because it's never done before. You figure out what you want and why you want it and the reasons, if they're strong enough, ignite the human imagination and we find answers. And we landed on the moon and came back with technology that has less than 1% of the amount of energy that technology you have in your phone right now. It's mind boggling how we got there and back, right? Because someone put the stakes in the ground. Someone was a leader. Martin Luther King got up and shared his dream. It was a big dream, still not a complete dream, but certainly has changed when for eight years, white people, brown people, black people all voted for President Obama, right? It's a different world. We can always find what's wrong. What's wrong is always available. So is what's right. And you have to be so careful because when you're constantly visioning something that's wrong, if our vision now, what is our vision in America? I don't know. Division might be our vision, right? What's the vision in our world today? Oh, we're going to survive global warming. That will not inspire anyone. Human psyche comes from inspiration. That's where our power is not desperation, although that can cause us to have some changes, that's for sure. I can remember when I was just in junior high school, and I was in the seventh grade, and I had, I'm old enough to remember, some of you may remember at the time we had the oil embargo, and suddenly there were gas lines miles long. And if you wanted gas, you couldn't get it on certain days, because your license determined it. If you had an odd number, you got to get it on one day. An even number, a different day. And I was just a kid, and I was like, I'll never have a car, I'll never drive. This is insane. And I remember I came into this class, this shop class, and we had this 70-year-old teacher, and he was really a wise guy, and wise both in wisdom and wise like razzing people. And he sat us all down and he goes, you guys, I know you're all worried about the future, I know you're all worried about the oil, and you have plenty of reasons why. Let me just read you this article. And he read us this article from the New York Times and that talked about how lights out, right? No more oil. The energy is going to drop. The quality of life for people all over the earth is going to go down. It went on and on and on and on. It was around the time the Club of Rome was saying the end of the world at the same time in the 70s. How many times have you heard the world's ending in your lifetime? If you lasted 50 or 60 years or more, you've heard it lots of times. But guess what? He reads the whole article. At the end, it sounds totally depressing. And then he holds it up and he reads the date. And it was whale oil he was talking about. <laughs> it was the New York Times, and of course we found a new way. And he said something so simplistic, we've all heard a million times, but I've never forgotten it. He said, necessity is the mother of an invention. When we have to, humans find the way. How many have always found the way when you had to, for your own life, for your own change, right? That, you don't need to have hope. You can have certainty by looking at the pattern of yourself and other humans. But on that ladder of growth, in order for that transformation from hope to certainty, you have to have a reason to do that. You need a vision. So that's what a Kennedy does. That's what a King did, right? That's what, if you look at Lee Kuan Yew, what he did in Singapore, took a place that was a god-awful place and transformed it. 
or go to UAE. MBZ is a friend of mine and Sheikh Tanoon, and uh, they partnered actually with an X Prize. To, we got a $15 million prize to find solutions for new forms of food. I put up the first million and a half, and they put up all the balance. Great people. But you see what they've done with their country. But they learned from their father. Baba Zayed, what did he do? He came along and he had a vision. We're running out of oil. Instead of freaking out and saying, oh my God, the world's going to end, he said, let's create. It's the difference between being a person who's trying to manage your circumstances versus a leader, which is someone who decides, I'm going to create the experience of this life, not just manage the circumstances. And so what did he do? He came up with a vision, Dubai. Anybody in Dubai 25 years ago? Any been there 25 years ago? A couple of you? Dirt. Three-story buildings, two-story buildings are the highest buildings in the whole place. He decides, I'm going to build a place that all the world's going to want to go. Now there's 9 million people there, and 88% of them are expats. And he told me, his dad said, you must think in 20 and 30-year segments, not quarters. You have to have a larger vision, and you've got to know why you're doing it. And he was attacked viciously because Christians wanted to come, oh my God, and build hospitals that they didn't have. And many people fought. Baba Zayed. But he said, here's what's clear. Everybody's worried the Christians are going to recruit the Muslims away. He said, no, they're just going to do good works. We're all going to learn how to live together. And you've been in modern Dubai today. It's pretty wild. It's people from all over the earth pulled in because there's vision and clarity. And like I said, Saudi Arabia, my gosh, four years ago, you couldn't drive a car if you're a woman. Probably not going to be in the workforce. Couldn't go to a Fashion show, fashion shows. Anybody see what the fashion shows used to look like in Saudi Arabia? They had drones carrying the purses. They didn't want any women up there doing that. But now you have a millennial, 37-year-old man who is driven and visionary, and he's got 20, 30 goals. And I had, for four days and nights, I had eight or nine meetings a day, and then the three-hour dinners, right? And sure enough, what was extraordinary during that time is everybody knows those 20, 30 goals. There's an alignment, there's a power, there's a vision, there's a direction. Without that, change does not happen. And if your vision is not a compelling future, you're gonna have a hard time creating long-term change. I hear people every day talking about, oh my God, I'm not gonna have a child. There's a generation of people that are afraid to have a kid because they think the world's gonna end in 12 years. The world is not gonna end, that is species hubris. The planet's gonna be just fine. You might not be. What do you mean we're gonna save the planet? What kind of BS is that? The planet's fine. It's like, what are you doing? And by making the worst scenario, people are trying to use fear to get people to behave a certain way instead of creating something more. We've always solved it. There's solutions right now. There's a new solution I just saw that I can't even hardly believe. I, I've signed an MOU on it, so I can't describe it, but it really is green energy that is cost effective. Hydrogen, done locally, and where all the waste products, whether it's any form of hydrocarbon, is put in graphite. And a graphite can then make batteries. Unbelievably efficient. Right now available, it's just about to be released. And I'm sure there's dozens of more examples like this that are about to happen. Most of the stuff we have out there obviously doesn't support. It doesn't produce enough. California says you can't have a car. It's terrible by 2030, even two days later, you can't plug in your electric car. We're just a little ahead of our skis, but we're going to get there. But painting the worst picture of fear is not going to happen. There's enough depression out there, wouldn't you agree? The numbers went crazy. In my country here, during COVID, when people are shut down, you take away a compelling future, and what happens? People get depressed, they commit suicide. Highest level of drug overdoses in the history of this country. Why? No compelling future. Actually, I was approached by Stanford. They had two professors that went through one of my six-day programs I do once a year. There's a documentary, if you're ever interested in seeing it, called Tony Robbins, I'm Not Your Guru, on Netflix. That's very popular. And so they saw that, then they came to this program I do once a year. And it's a program where you basically decide what your values and beliefs have been, and you figure out where they're strong, where they're weak, and you decide to change them. I don't tell you what to do, but I show you how. And it's a rewiring of your biochemistry. So they said these two professors came back, and both of them have been clinically depressed, no symptoms of depression. They said, we can't even believe it. What data do you have? I said, well, I have millions of people's lives and testimonials for this is going to be my 46th year doing this. I started when I was two, of course. <laughs> and they said, no, but like science. I said, well, what, do you want to do one? Let's do a study. They said, yes. I said, well, tell me, depression's out of control right now. What's the best treatment? What do the meta-studies show? And I found out something was, I don't know if you know this, it's horrible. 
60% of the people who go for treatment of depression have no improvement whatsoever with drugs or therapy. 60%. 40% improve, but the average improvement is 50%, so they're half as depressed as they were. Now, some people get fully well and some people don't, but I said, you can almost do that you know, with a placebo, and they laughed and said yes. I said, what's the best study that's ever been done? And I said, well, there was a study done four years ago at Johns Hopkins, and they treated people for a month with psilocybin, magic mushrooms, basically, and therapy. Well, I hope the shit their lives changed after a month of that, right? <laughs> sure enough, after a month of that, they got the greatest result that's ever been measured in psychiatry up until now. 54% of the people, 30 days later, had no symptoms of depression. Nothing like it in the history of psychology. And then I said, why don't we do a study? I said, well, why don't you do it just like this one? We just won't use the drugs, use the same contrasting group. And they did. At the end of 30 days, the results were so astounding, they didn't want to publish it. They thought no one was going to believe it, so they blind sent the information out to other organizations, and they finally published it in the Journal of Psychiatry last year. 100% of the people, after six days, not a single person had any symptoms whatsoever of depression. Even more importantly, 17% of the people who had suicidal ideation, none had suicidal ideation. Even better, a year later, 11 months later, they tested the same people, having no new interaction, and found a reduction in negative emotions of 71% and positive emotions by 52, changes in anxiety, changes in anything you can imagine 11 months later, because they had a biochemical change, an emotional change, not a temporary emotion, because the emotions are coming from our beliefs and our values. Those are the anchors that hold us in place. So I tell you this because there's plenty to be excited about. There's plenty of tools and technology that people can use to change. But we need to create a compelling future for people, and what's getting in the way of that? I think our dear friends in the media have the best of intent. I have many friends in the media, I'm sure you do too. They have no bad intent whatsoever. But the system rewards getting your attention. And we all know what gets your attention, anger and fear. And so that's the entire economic model. I mean, people say we're in the information age. You and I both know that died a long time ago, right? I mean, we're drowning in information. We're starving for wisdom. So what happens? If it bleeds, it leads. No one's trying to do us harm. And today, I was reading the FII study that was showing that, was it 130,000 people, 13 countries? I'm sure you guys saw it. 70% of the people in wealthy countries, other than Africa, have a very negative view of the future. People in poor countries, and people in the Middle East, and people in Asia, they're, they're growing, totally optimistic about the future. What's the difference? Media. I think you and I have to stand guard the door of our minds every day because the media has no bad intent, but it can be poisonous. I have one of my dear friends who was one of my teachers decades ago said to me one day, Tony, think of it this way. What happens if your worst enemy drops strychnine in your coffee? Or drops sugar, I should say. Your worst enemy drops sugar in your coffee. I said, well, you'd have sweet coffee. He said, what if your best friend by accident drops one drop of strychnine? You'd be dead. It doesn't matter their intent. So we have to guard at what that looks like. And by the way, is there reason to be more than hopeful? All you got to do is look at the pattern of humanity. In the last 120 years, since 1900 to now, 123 years to be accurate, we have doubled the lifespan of human beings. That's unbelievable. And we're probably going to do something very similar, at least 50% with the new technologies come out. By the way, I put a book out for you because I have so little time to chat, and I want to add value to you, and you're all leaders. And the one thing I know is a person with health has a million dreams, a person without it has one. So this is a result of interviewing 150 of the top uh, scientists, regenerative doctors in the world, things on stem cells, things on everything you can imagine. So that is a little gift to you that I hope will bless your life in some way. But the point of the matter is, if we're going to make real results happen, we've got to be able to see how well we've really done. So we've doubled the lifespan. We've tripled the per capita income of every nation on Earth, if literally on Earth over the last 25 years, 30 years, excuse me, 120 years in that case. We have taken the cost of food down 30-fold. Still got problems with distribution, significant ones. We've taken the cost of communication down, literally millions of percent, travel by hundreds of percent. We've made so much change. In 1990, there were 1.9 billion people on the Earth. Now there's 8 billion. There weren't that many people back then, right? We're just hitting 8 billion, about to right now. But think about it. 1.9 billion people living on $1.90 a day in extreme poverty was the definition. 
1.2 billion of them are no longer in extreme poverty, and we have more humans on Earth. There's only 685 million. Now, COVID and our response to it has made it pretty tough in some places. So I'm not deluded by that because I was fed when I was 11 years old and we had no food, so I'm highly sensitized to food security because I've lived it. I don't want anybody to suffer. In fact, when I was really young, we got fed, and I decided when I was 17 to feed two families and then four, and then I got to a million people, and then eventually I got it up to two million, and then about eight years ago, I was doing this interview, 50 interviews of the 50 smartest investors on earth, the Warren Buffetts, the Ray Dalys, the Carl Icons, trying to take what they had, simplify it for the general population, as well as my billionaire clients. And in doing it, at the same time doing these interviews with the richest people on earth, I'm watching our Congress in America wipe out the SNAP program, that used to be called food stamps, take away six billion from it. it. Means every family in America that needs food, really needs it, would have to go out with a week without food every month unless people like you and I stepped up. So I called my offices and said, how many people have I fed in my lifetime? And it was 42 million people, I was thrilled. And I thought, vision, what if I fed as many people in one year as I've done in my whole life? What if I fed 50 million people in a year? And I thought, what if I fed 100 million people in a year? And I thought, what if I fed 100 million people in a year for 10 straight years and provided a billion meals? Well, I need a great partner for distribution, so I went to Feeding America. And three weeks ago, I just completed that two years early. We just fed a billion people in the U.S. alone, to give you an idea. That's what I was very thrilled about. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate the applause, but I wasn't telling you for that reason, because the problem is much bigger now. Because just as I'm about to complete this, and I'm sure you've seen this in your life, when you're about to complete a goal, the purpose of a goal is not just to get the goal, it's who you become in pursuit of it, right? What you get's never gonna make you happy. Who you become, that'll make you really happy or really sad. And so as you're starting to achieve a goal, you don't want to see that drop that happens, you want to set the next one. Why do I have to work on it? Because Governor Beasley reached out to him, I met him through MBZ a few years back. MBZ said, Tony, I want you to come to lunch. There's someone who's feeding more people than you are. I said, great, I want to meet him. And of course, he's the head of the World Food Program for the UN. He'll be, he's going to be leaving shortly. Beautiful man. Governor Beasley, he won the Nobel Prize a couple years ago for what he's doing. He knows more about food insecurity on this earth than anybody else. He's tried to influence governments everywhere. And he said, Tony, it's much worse. Because right now, right now, in the past, you have 80 million people a year on the verge of dying from lack of hunger. You have a child that dies every five seconds. It's horrific. But now it's much worse. Why? because our policies around COVID stopped travel. And in African countries, some of them, 80% of their income comes from tourism. They have no money for two and a half years. Second, the war in Ukraine, I'm sure you all know, it's the breadbasket. Normally feeds 400 million people. Shut down. The WF would prefer that we don't use fertilizer, and yet it produces 50% of all food on Earth right now. And most of it's coming out of Russia, which means it's not coming. So there are 18 nations on the verge right now of famine. So he was having a Twitter war with Elon Musk, and I said, I don't know if that's the best solution, <laughs> right? Elon's kind of an independent guy. And he said, well, will you come with me and let's go around to all these individual wealthy people and ask them to write a big check? And I said, well, when I interviewed Warren Buffett years ago, he told me the giving pledge didn't take off right away, even with Warren Buffett. But when he started sponsoring the Forbes philanthropy dinner, the wealthiest families in the world started getting competitive in a good way. And then the thing, whole, whole thing exploded to the beautiful thing it is today. I said, so I know Steve, I have some friends, we're trying to buy Forbes right now. And I said, um, maybe Warren would let us have 45 minutes at that dinner, because people don't understand, even if you don't care about people, the instability in the world that's gonna come from this if we don't do something. And I said, you know, I'll speak for 15, 20 minutes, but I said, Governor Beasley, you should get up, you know more than anybody else and tell the story. And sure enough, Warren agreed to it, and then Warren got sick, so we took over the dinner, and I met some good friends there. And we raised five billion meals on the planet right then, because I said, look, I need 99 people like me. We're gonna do 100 billion meals. We have about a 75 billion challenge, let's get above it. And then we're working on the X Prize for the long-term solution, but right now, we need it over the next 10 years, 100 billion meals. And uh, people stood up, I figured, I'm not a multi-billionaire, we gotta find 99 more people like me. So we did, we got five billion meals on the spot, and now a couple other people have stepped up, we're at 60 billion meals in six months for a 10-year goal of 100 billion meals. So anything's possible with vision and certainty, because when I first came up with it, it sounds impossible, right? It's not been done for you know, 100 billion meals. When I came up with a billion meals, it sounded impossible. Everything's impossible until somebody does it. We gotta bring that to the table. 
That's what this room is made up of. Leaders can find that certainty in yourself, and most of you have done it. That's why you're here, right? But we got to transfer that to other humans on a major scale. If we do that, it's a different game. And can we have certainty about the future? Can we truly? Well, let's just look at it. You're all geniuses in some area. I'm not trying to throw smoke, but if you got in this room, you got to be really smart. I love wickedly smart people. What makes people wickedly smart? Well, the thing I want for my children. I have five kids, five grandkids. I got a 49-year-old daughter, and I have a two-year-old daughter. I have quite a spread, right? And what do I want for all of them? When I read about the fact that every study shows that AI is going to replace things, nanotechnology, right, robots, 40, 50 percent of the jobs are going to disappear. No, that's not a problem. We'll get new jobs. It's the tempo that might be the problem, right? 125 years ago, 85 percent of America was a farmer. Today, it's 3 percent. We feed the world, but that was over 130 years to find out there are other jobs like webmaster. But guess what? This change is going to happen so fast. Think about it. If all you did was take Uber drivers, truck drivers, and taxi drivers, five million of them in the U.S. Just in the U.S. Do you really think they're going to have a job in five years or ten? I don't know what the real time is. Are you going to really, as a company, pay for a truck driver that can work eight hours a day, complains, and has very expensive health insurance? When you're going to have a robot truck that works 24 hours a day without a mistake, and you get to write down the depreciation on it? Five million jobs in that category alone. No one is warning these people. That's how many jobs were eliminated during 2008, so you know, when all hell was breaking loose, five million jobs. So we have to do something. But here's the good news. Certainty is available because we can look around and see history. You're all patterns, good at patterns. Here's what I teach my kids. There's three skills you need. Tell me if you agree. Skill one, pattern recognition. If you're good at pattern recognition, you'll always be great at learning, and you can learn whatever you need to go to the next level. Pattern recognition allows you and I to move from a place where we're in fear because things feel random, like we're unclear about it. It feels like chaos to know there's a pattern to this. And if you study history, there's clear patterns. What's the history of humanity? It's creativity, it's solution orientation. We've made it, as I said, through everything. No war lasts forever. No pandemic lasts forever. No recession, no depression lasts forever. Longer than we want, probably, but not forever. We always find the way. We always turn it around. You don't have to hope. You can know. But it's our job to bring that forward because you're not hearing that in the media, which is the primary source of information for the average person today, unfortunately. And all they hear is gloom and doom. Why? Because that's what gets your attention. That's what sells. At CNN. You know, I don't know if you guys saw the Project Veritas guy was interviewing one of the directors there, and he was talking about how they had the red phone, and Jeff Zucker would call and say, "Put up those death numbers, COVID. Put them up, because the numbers would spike." And then no one was responding anymore. And he goes, "Okay, here's our new strategy." The guy talked about it because he was being recorded and didn't know it. And he said, "Jeff said our whole new strategy is this climate change because you can scare the hell out of people and it never goes away, right?" And we just keep pushing that. People watch. They're fearful. Fear sells. So we have a responsibility to do something more. Let's look at history for one second. If you have pattern recognition, the second skill is pattern utilization. Everyone in this room who's good at whatever you're good at, whether you're a great financial trader, you're great in business, you're a great writer, you have great pattern recognition, but you also know how to use patterns, not let the patterns use you. And those that are really powerful, people in this room, and hopefully what this room was about is pattern creation, new pattern creation. That's when the world really changes. Right. So if you think about this, let's look at the core pattern. What pattern recognition and utilization changed humanity from wandering around as hunter-gatherers, not knowing we're going to starve or not, to having communities and cities? One pattern recognition. What was it? Who knows what changed humanity? One pattern. One recognition of pattern. Productivity. Okay. But before productivity, what made us productive? Let's start when we're hunter-gatherers. The answer is seasons. When we understood the pattern of seasons, humanity changed because we learned something. If you do the right thing at the wrong time, you don't get rewarded. If you plant in the winter, I don't give a damn how hard you worked. It's not going to happen. Once we understood, you plant in the spring, you protect in the summer, you reap in the fall, and you keep some for the winter. We could build communities. We could build cities, states. That's where the whole world began to change. So now let's look at the pattern of history just for a second. By the way, are there patterns in your life? 
Zero to 20 is a pattern. It's different for everybody, but there's some overall pieces. You're mostly being taught how to think and be. 21 to 41 or 22 to 42, and it's different for everybody, that's when you're the soldier of society. That's when you say, bull, I was taught all these things, but I want to test what I believe. When you're less than 20, you're invincible. You know you're going to be president of the United States, you're going to be a multi-billionaire and have 100 relationships. Now you can't even keep one relationship in your book. So you have to figure out how it works. So 22 to 42 is that figuring it out, right? The soldier. 43 to, 50, or to 63, roughly, that's when you're in your power. That's when you become the leader. Now you can do more with your thing pinky than you used to do 12 hours a day. Who can relate to this? How many of you, because your contacts, your relationships, your experience, your intelligence, you could do more with almost less than you ever did before? Who can relate to this in this room, right? That's as you enter that stage. And then maybe 64 to 84, up to 120 as the oldest living humans, maybe that's the time that you get to be the mentor. You get to share, because you're not trying to prove yourself to yourself or anybody else. You know who the hell you are with this stage and you got some wisdom to be able to share that's actually real. It's not about ego, it's about helping in some way. So those are stages. But there's also, lastly, I want you to see patterns in history. So let's do a quick, quick, simple one, whether you're from America or not. 1910, stay with me for a moment. If you're born in 1910, those first 20 years of your life, 19 years of your life, a lot of cool things happen if you were in America, as an example. Well, tons of inventions, we won World War I, there was this tremendous excitement for the end of the war. We all of a sudden had radio, we had television, we had planes, cars, and people were partying, man. They were having it, the roaring 20s, right? So these kids growing up in that time, they were looked like, millennials were looked like by older generations or now the Z generation. Millennials are now getting old, they're 42, right? The oldest ones, they're coming into their power. But a lot of people say they're snowflakes. You know, if you have a different point of view, they can't handle it, right? They're not safe. That's not all millennials. There's some. But guess what? That generation that I'm telling you became known as the greatest generation in American history. And they were disrespected, they were irresponsible, and they were weak. But here's what happened. They grew up, and right around 19 years old, if you're born in 1910, it's what year? Calculators are available, 1929. What happened in 1929? Worldwide depression. Here in America, people jumping out of buildings, people standing in bread lines. The Midwest was a dust bowl. Right at the point they're gonna get a car and go party, their entire world was shooken up. And to survive it, they had to get stronger. And they went through 10 years of it, not a year or two. You know, 1932, 33, a little bit of a break, but boom, right back into depression. And guess what? What was the reward they got when they made it through 10 years of depression and now they're 29 years old? What year is that? 1939. What happened in 1939? Well, none of us were alive then, but let's remember it's called World War II. Right? I thought we had the greatest war, the war of all wars. No, we got a much worse war. And by the way, if you were alive at that time and you had a grandparent, they'll tell you it looked like the world was ending, not like we're going to go up a few degrees in temperature. The world was ending. Hitler was coming along and strafing countries in days. He was bombing London. And they went to war. These weak people went to war. They were no longer weak. They became incredibly strong. They won the war. They came home. And now they're what? 45 years old, 50, and there's a new season. That was winter, 20 years of winter. You can watch a 1,000 years of Roman history, and you'll see about every 20, 25 years this same cycle. You can look at, I remember I, I went to speak, I was coaching the President of the United States at the time, President Clinton, and I left him, you couldn't do this today, and I went over and talked to the Speaker of the House, Gingrich, who was a Republican, I'm an independent, I wanted to help both of them, no one said a word. Today, someone would shoot you in the head if you attempted that, right? But think about it, they both had the same book on their desk called Generations, a book you might want to read. Large book, 585 years of Anglo-American history, and it shows how as generations are raised, how it changes the way they respond to big crises and how history creates these cycles. There's another book that's probably easier to read called The Fourth Turning. If you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. It'll help you understand it's not chaos. These patterns happen. You'll be reading the book very much like the gentleman I told you about who was my teacher, and you're reading something you think it's now, and then they go and show you it was 80 years ago. And they'll show you another one from 80 years before that. It's the same dynamics that we're dealing with. The seasons are pretty consistent. So here's my question. What happened? We went from winter time to now spring. Isn't that cool? 
What follows the horrible night is the day. What follows winter is springtime. In springtime, there's optimism. At least in this country, people came back, they were excited, we came to the suburbs. If you're a veteran, we gave you a house. It was a cool time. Think how different the late 40s, 50s, till about 1963 when Kennedy died. Think of the optimism in this country, if you knew it or around then. It was incredible optimism. And then you go through the hot summer of internal turmoil that happens every 80 years like clockwork. And what happened? Kennedy is killed. Then Martin Luther King is killed. Then Robert Kennedy is killed. All hell breaks loose. How are kids responding? Completely differently in the 60s and 70s than they were in the 40s and 50s. They're not going to go to war. Hell no, I won't go. Some of them were conscientious objectors. They didn't want to go because they didn't want to hurt somebody they thought had hurt them. Others just didn't want to go. A very different world. If you ask people, which they've done for 50, almost 60 years now in college, this question, which is more important for your life, a philosophy of life that makes you happy or the practical skills to be financially free? What do you think the answer was by 82% of the people in the 1960s and 70s in college? Which one? Philosophy of life to make you happy or pragmatic skills for economic freedom? philosophy to be happy, 82%. But then the, think of the 80s and 90s and 2000s, were there anything like the 60s and 70s? Completely different mood, isn't it? It's a new season. By the way, all of a sudden, Wall Street, greed is good. There's a whole different world that's out there. And when they ask the same question, by the way, those baby boomers were protected by their parents, they were sent to college, they're told they're brilliant, you're gonna be smarter than me, and their kids believed it but they were not there for their kids. They were busy on their mission or finding their inner self. So most of their kids were raised differently, latchkey kids. They had to be very pragmatic. They had to take care of themselves. They had to turn on the TV, they had to let themselves in. You ex-generation people in this room know what I'm talking about. Not everybody's the same, but as a generation, it was different. And when they asked those people in the 80s, 90s, 2000, 83% said, which one? Economics, right? And now where are we today? We're in winter again. We're about halfway through it. If you study history, we're not done. It's going to get more difficult before it gets better. There's probably going to be a big war. There certainly will be at least a cyber war. There's certainly going to be some major conflicts as the changing world order occurs. So you don't want to freak out because it's winter. If you freak out because it's winter, like, you got, you got to love the season you're in. And every season has opportunity and challenge, every single one. You can freeze to death in winter, or you can learn to snowboard and ski. You can build by a fire with your family and develop what needs to be done. But we've got more challenging times. That doesn't mean, this is, by the way, what winter looks like in South Florida. Right, Mayor? <laughs> right? This is your horrible winter here, right? So winter doesn't mean every day is horrible. It just means the overall level of optimism is quite low, and people focus more on the problem than the solution, and it's a pattern that we go through. But you don't have to live the pattern of the world. That's what makes you a leader. People or followers follow the culture. Leaders create the culture. I suggest that's really what we have the opportunity to do. So I'm not worried about millennials or Z generation. I think they're going to be the next great heroes of our next generations because they're going to face huge challenges and they're going to grow. How do I know that? Study history. Is it a guarantee? There's no guarantee. You and I can walk across the street and get hit by a car. But the probability is a lot more than hope. Who's with me on this? Say I if you agree with me on this. Right? So let me give you three quick little skills that you might find useful to accelerate the pattern of change. Because I get called in, I've worked with so many different sports teams, I'm privileged to have rings from three different NBA teams, Major League Baseball team, hockey, and I just, I'm an owner of a couple teams, the LAFC, we won last year, I just got my next ring, it's kind of fun. But they're kind of symbols of being able to produce a massive change very quickly in a sports team, which is really measurable. And then I have the for good fortune, I have 111 companies now, we do $7 billion in business. I had no business background, but I learned the patterns of business, I learned how to grow businesses, I learned how to expand them, same type of thing. But one of the things I've learned was mentioned on the stage a few moments ago by Adam, momentum. Momentum may be the single most important thing we need to shift as leaders. You've done that here in Miami, and I'm not just pointing you it out, it's a different city, it's a different place. Crime has been changed, even though you've had challenges during spring break and so forth, the technology that you've done, you and I have talked about it, where you know a gunshot goes off and boom, they can target where it is in the city, all of a sudden a drone goes there, and they also at the same time release the ambulances, so lives are saved, people are caught. 
It's quite amazing what you've done with technology and a whole different view of what this city can be, this gateway to technology, this gateway to South America. So change, again, comes from those types of visions, but momentum is what we need. So do you ever notice the rich get richer and the poor get poorer? And I don't mean just financially rich, I mean really rich. You ever notice how happy people tend to get more happy? Angry people get more angry? Sad people get more sad? Who's noticed this pattern out there, right? So that's momentum. You see it in sports all the time. There's a team that is dominating and then somebody does something and sparks a change and what happens? It's not hope, it's excitement, it's certainty. The team goes, we can still win this. And all of a sudden there's this transfer of momentum. So I'd like to show you, because I've worked with so many athletes, so many business leaders, because we all lose momentum at times. Who's ever gotten stuck where you're just not finding the solutions even though you're smart? Yeah, four of you. The rest of you have never been stuck. Thank you very much. <laughs> Who's ever been stuck? <laughs> okay, good. Thank you. No more lying in this room. Thank you. I appreciate that. So let me give you something. You can take a picture of this if you want. It's really simplistic. That's why it works. By the way, one of my philosophies right towards momentum and business is, uh, you know, most people make things too complex. Let me jot down, complexity is the enemy of execution. Complexity is the enemy of execution. Make it too complex, people don't follow through. So I want to make something really simple. So this is what I do with athletes, business people, and so forth. So you see these four squares. Potential on the top left, action on the right, results at the bottom, and belief or certainty on the left. So here's my question. What do you think the potential is for any human being to have an extraordinary life? What's the potential? Unlimited, okay, that's powerful, guys. How many think it's unlimited? I'm curious, make some noise if you're out there, if you're still alive out there. Are you out there, ladies and gentlemen? Let me hear you, come on. Unlimited. <laughs> so guess what? It's not totally unlimited, right? There's limits to our potential. But how many would agree our potential is much greater than most people realize? How many agree with that? Say I. So do most people's results, this bottom right-hand corner over here, do most people's results reflect their true potential? What would you say, yes or no? No? Why not? Why not? Well, somebody said, because they're not taking enough action. That's true, I'm a real believer in the massive action can be a cure-all. But if you take massive action and you're uncertain that it's gonna work, you're hoping, you're, that's what we call trying. Do you ever hear somebody say, oh, I've tried that, it didn't work. How many times did you try it? How many different ways did you try it? What was the state you tried it in? If you're in sales and you knock on 100 doors and say, you wouldn't want to buy this from me, would you? Someone's going to buy because they don't want to see your kids starve. But it's not going to be a high percentage. So it isn't enough to take action. It's action with execution requires certainty. So watch this. If someone says, let's go make this thing happen, and it's, have you ever done this? How many of you have ever done this? Ever said, I'm gonna make this happen. You set some goal, some huge thing you're gonna make happen, and right after you did it, your brain went, who are you kidding? Who's had an experience like this before? I'm curious, right? So what happens is, if we don't have a lot of certainty, are we gonna maximize our potential, yes or no? No way. And when you don't, aren't certain, and you're not using a lot of potential, are you gonna take massive action with total certainty? No. So now you're gonna take little action, little potential, little action, and what kind of result is that gonna create? It's predictable, little crappy results. When you get little crappy results, tell me what that does to your belief or certainty. Your brain goes, see, I told you it was all BS, I told you it couldn't be done, I told you it was a bunch of hype, I told you it doesn't work. Now you believe even less, you have less certainty. With less certainty, guess what? You tap less potential, right? You take less action, you get even worse results, and your brain goes, see, and now you're in the downward spiral. I know you've never done this, but I know you've seen other people do this in some area of their life. Other people, come on, show of hands, good, right? But can it work on the opposite side? I just bumped into my friend Tom Brady in the uh, uh, hotel, I'm coming the way down. Tom's unbelievable, right? Greatest quarterback in history. What's made Tom so great? Been a friend and client of mine for a while. It's his ability when everybody else is uncertain to bring certainty to the team. He's down by 10 points, it's the Super Bowl, and there's two minutes left. And he just goes in this mode where, boom, he's going to execute and make it happen. Now, it doesn't always work, but he's got more Super Bowl rings than any team, right? <laughs> pretty, pretty amazing. What does Tom do? I'll tell you exactly what he does because I worked with him on it. He produces this certainty. We all get uncertain. Do you think Tom ever gets uncertain? Of course. But he knows how to snap back into it, into his body, in his mind and body, which work as one. If you can find a way to get that certainty, then all of a sudden when you're certain, you're gonna tap more potential. 
And when you're certain, you're willing to take massive action because you're not going to be disappointed. You know it's going to work. So now when you take massive potential with total certainty, massive action, what kind of results are you going to get more than likely? Pretty damn good results. When you get great results, what does it do to your belief or certainty? Your brain goes, see, I told you I was a stud or studette. I told you I'd make this happen. I told you this is how it was going to be, right? And then what happens? You're even more certain. You tap more potential. You get more action, more results. By the way, you've done this enough times, then you develop a history that when shit happens, your brain goes, I can handle that, which is what Tom does. It's probably what you do in your business. I've been around for a little while, so what all my businesses, they all have different cycles, just like human beings have cycles. You got these young businesses growing, yet mature businesses. They all have different things, like different children. But I've done enough of it that when everybody's panicked, it's like, how many of you have more than one child? Who's got more than one child here? How many of you raised your second or third child different than your first? Yes, when your first child has an earache, it's an earache. Oh my God, call the doctor. By your fourth child, it's like, it's an earache. <laughs> Do you love your child less? No, it's just you have a few experiences now. You know this is part of the pattern. You don't overreact to it. So this momentum can be created. So let's try something. You've been sitting for a while, we're almost done. Would you stand up just for a moment? Let's test something out, just for fun. Shake your body out, you've been sitting for a while here. You're gonna shake it out a little bit here. That's right. And here's what I'd like you to do if you would. I'd like you to put your feet so they're touching, pointing straight ahead. Touching right against each other, that's it. And then I want you to raise your right index finger like this. And when I say now, I want you to turn clockwise comfortably and just notice where you naturally end, okay? Now turn clockwise comfortably, notice where you naturally end. Okay, come back around, take your finger out of your neighbor's ear. <laughs> These were close quarters, drop your hand. Now, most people, if you fill that graphic back up again, most people, if I said, if you're on the downward spiral, right, we've all been there sometimes, right? In fact, how many of you have been on the upward spiral in one area of your life, let's say your business downward on your body or your kids or something else? Who can relate to this here? Say I. So if you're on the downward spiral, where do you change it? Do you change your potential? No, it's already there. Could you take more action? Yes, but if it's not certain action, well, I gotta believe more, but how do I believe more when I've never done it before? What every great leader does, and I'm sure you've done a million times, what every great athlete does, is they produce the result in their mind so vividly over and over again that then the body and everything takes over. So let's try it in a little simplistic example. Keep your feet together, close your eyes. And with your eyes closed, just for a moment, I want you to imagine your fingers coming up again. Don't actually do it, but vividly imagine your fingers coming up again, and now you're turning twice as far and it's effortless. Really feel it. And then again in your mind, bring that finger up in your mind, and this time feel yourself turning three times as far, and it's effortless. And then one more time, this time when you do it, imagine you're like an owl, your feet stay straight, and you turn all the way around, and it's effortless. Go ahead and reach out, go all the way around, and every time you do it, you go further, and every time you expect to go further, and every time you enjoy it. When you're a kid, did you ever say, mom, dad, measure me? I measured you last week, I think I'm bigger. Okay, open your eyes, bring your finger out. Now turn as far as you can comfortably and let's see where you go now, this time. As far as you can comfortably, what happens? Oh, by the moaning, and something changed. How many went significantly further this time? Say I. How many went at least 25% further? Say I. Okay, then grab a seat if you would and answer this simple question for me. If we look back at this chart, could you, did you have the potential to turn as far as you did the second time the first time, yes or no? Of course, then why didn't you? Because you even have a belief about how far you can turn, you're just unaware of it. So how do you change it? All we did was get our brain to imagine it over and over again until it believed it and then the body took over. By the way, if you remember the four minute mile, for almost a thousand years, humans tried to run a four minute mile, humanly impossible, till one man in the 50s, Roger Bannister, did it. Does anybody know how he did it? He practiced in his mind, he stopped running. He saw it over and over, but he, it was, it's not practice makes perfect, it's perfect practice makes perfect. He practiced his mind over and over, he saw the result over and over and over again. But what's even more powerful about certainty is no one had done that in history, and watch what happens three months later, throw it up on the screen, 45 days later, another guy runs a four minute mile. Why? Because he wasn't hoping anymore, he was absolutely what? certain it could be done. 
So if that guy could do it, so can I. How many of you have had that in your life? If that person could do it, so can I. Let's see a show of hands. So that's why we reward high performers disproportionately. A year later, three more runners. Now, 200 runners, 24 years later. By the way, many of them are high school students doing four minute mile. Every four years, we go to the Olympics and people compete and we jump higher, we run faster, we lift more weight. How's that possible? Drugs, no, just kidding, just kidding. <laughs> right? It's because this momentum model continues. We as human beings, as we see a result, we disproportionately reward those that produce those results because they make it possible for someone else to step up. And the more that step up, the more society changes. How many have ever seen an athlete walk out on the field, let's say football, if you know, American football, and there's like a kicker, or maybe NBA basketball, and someone's gonna do a free throw, and you look at them and you say, even if you're not into the sport, they're gonna miss it. And you were right. Who's done this before? Say I. How did you know? You could see the lack of certainty inside them. So momentum is created by that certainty. So what do we need for more momentum? Try energy. Energy is the single most important element to transformation of anything. More energy, more resolution, more choices, more options, more actions. Lower energy, and guess what we have? We have an entire world that was shut down for two or three years sitting on their ass, sitting on machines, so much so that in my country, they don't even want to come to work anymore. Three days of work, no effing way. Why would I do that? Why would I come to work when I can stay at home in my pajamas and sit on my ass for more and gain another 10 pounds? That's not in Saudi Arabia, that's not in the Middle East, that's not in Asia, that's America. Which is why if we don't change, there's gonna be some big changes in the world that are already happening. And it's a psychological problem, isn't it? So let me give you two tools to finish. Is this helpful? Yes. Awesome, thank you. And by the way, you've been really wonderful. So next, let's look at what will control that. First of all, you all run businesses or organizations, you know the most basic key to running a business successfully is what you don't measure, you don't manage. In order to manage something, you gotta measure it. When I take over a company or I buy a company or buy a piece, the very first thing I do is figure out a dozen of the most important elements of that business and I measure it like crazy. If you measure once a year, you're gonna have bad years. If you measure once a month, you're not gonna have bad years because you got 12 times you see what's going on and you've got time to fix it. If you measure once a day, you're not gonna have bad weeks. And in some of those businesses, I'll measure things hourly for the first few months until I train everybody to be focused in a different way. Where focus goes, energy flows. And so we have to measure. The question is, are you measuring your own energy? Because the challenge is, our standard of energy has gone through the floor as a society. And if you come in all a lot of energy, like easy for you, or what's wrong with you? But, you know, successful people do what the failures don't, and energy is the secret. So here's my question. In a relationship, let's use a relationship because it's easier, it doesn't have the same charge. If you have two people in a relationship and they're totally, completely in love, I mean, they adore each other, and they have super high levels of energy, they're taking care of themselves, they're rocking it, what kind of relationship is this gonna be? Is it gonna be okay? Is it gonna be terrible? Is it gonna be good? Is it gonna be amazing? Shout it out, what's it gonna be? It's gonna be amazing. Now, what if the same two people love each other just as much, but they let themselves get worn down a bit by all the challenges of life. They got a you know, small business, there's some cash flow issues, you know, they're exhausted, they got 13 soccer practices, they're trying to make this happen, trying to be every role they possibly could be, and their energy drops down. Not bad, it's just like, you know, good. You know, better than dead. Is it gonna be the same quality relationship? Yes or no? Even though they love each other just as much, yes or no? No, you know it's not. What if, they get beat up. They get overwhelmed by their world, by listening to the media, the whole world's coming to an end, oh my God, what are we gonna do? Recession's on its way, inflation's out of control, oh my God, we're gonna have global warming. It's just, it, the whole thing is coming in, we're, we're, gonna have to, we're gonna have to give up everything. It's a different world, a shrinking world. Or they're just dealing with their daily life and they're burnt out, they don't take care of their bodies, their energy is super low. Who's ever been in that place? Yes, okay, it's more truthful people. How many have been in that place? <laughs> okay, good. So when you get in that place, you can say and do things you don't really mean and people don't forget it. True? Is this gonna be an amazing relationship, a good relationship, or is this relationship gonna have problems, you tell me? 
going to have problems. How many of you would agree, by a show of hands, honestly, that energy might be the single most important key to changing anything, increased energy? Then if that's true, we have to embody it and we have to measure it. So let me ask you an honest question. You've been here for a couple of days. You've been in a great environment. If I were to ask you honestly, on a zero to 10 scale, 10 is unstoppable energy. It's okay. <laughs> and zero is dead. If you were totally honest, because the truth sets you free, and if it wasn't good, it's okay, because you to change it, just have it, where would you say your midpoint is? Where would you have been on average, would you say? Shout it out. Oh, let me, let me get simple, I'll ask. How many would say it was five or below? How many say six? Mm -hmm. Seven? Eight? Nine? Tens. By, by the way, I want you to notice something. Tens did something no one else did. Did you hear what it was? They made sound. You know why? Because in order to get to 10, you got to use your body, including your voice. I'm Tony Robbins, and you're not. Over the next 7,000 hours of this seminar, <laughs> who's been around somebody? You just want to shake them because there's not enough energy there, right? So you can shift your energy very, very quickly, but I'll give you a little clue. Where does energy come from? Where does it come from? Food? <laughs> Food? <laughs> How many of you can remember your last big holiday meal? How many can remember your last big giant holiday meal? Who can remember? In this country, Thanksgiving, Christmas, how many can remember your last holiday meal? Come on, who can remember that? What do we do on a big holiday like that? We go, it's Thanksgiving, so I want to give thanks to my body, so I'm going to have broccoli and shit. No, that's not what you do. What do you do? How much food do we eat at that time? How much? More than we can possibly bear. And when you can't eat another drop, what do you say? I'll never eat again. And someone goes, pumpkin pie? And you go, okay. <laughs> and at the end of that, are you ready to go for a sprint? Are you going to go play football? What do you feel like doing? A little, get in front of the TV, a little nap, right? So food is a source of energy. It's not the source of energy. In fact, how many of you have ever fasted for three days or more, three days or more? Does your energy increase? Not the first day. <laughs> first day is a, a bitch, right? But two, three days into it, does your energy increase without food or decrease? Which one? Shout it out. Increase. Which one? Increase. The food is not your source of energy. Someone else said sleep. Well, how many of you have ever had eight hours of sleep and you're still freaking tired? Raise your hand if you can relate to this, right? It's not sleep either. It's psychology. It's a habit. So just for a second, would you do something crazy with me for a second? Would you be to try something? I, it's a habit. It's the way you move. It's the way you speak. So try some just for a second. Stand up just for a moment. Shake your body out just for a moment. And then I'm just going to give you one last thing after this. Thank you. will enjoy. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to find somebody in the room and point at them and go, I own you. I'll say it like you mean it. I own you. I own you. No, I own you. I own you. Now, are there any competitive people in the house? Any competitive people at all in the house? Good. What does the word competition mean? In its Latin root, competition means to conspire together. If I'm going to play basketball with you, I'm going to push you as hard as I can to make you better. I want you to push me as hard as you can so I get better. And we can do the same thing with energy. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. You're going to try it again. You're going to go, I own you. No, I own you, just playfully, like a little kid. This is not harsh. Don't worry. And then what you're going to do is, what you're really saying is, I am challenging you, you low-energy person. I'm going to outdo your energy. And what we're going to do for just 20 seconds is wake your body up, because you've been sitting forever here. And let's shake your body awake. And here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to celebrate like a little kid, out-celebrate that person for no good reason. Oh, people, that's stupid. Why would I celebrate for no good reason? Well, most people don't need a reason to feel like crap. You go, how's it going? Oh, uh, okay. How come? Woke up. <laughs> so just being playful. Who's want to be a kid just for 20 seconds here? Who's want to give it a shot here? Just put some energy. So your job is outdo your partner's energy. That means you're jumping, moving, and using your voice playfully. Now, uh, let's start with a voice that's less threatening. Right now, make the sound you're making if you were totally excited and you're a kid. Make an exciting sound. Go ahead. <laughs> Do it again and enjoy it this time. One more time and really enjoy it. Does that feel good in your body, yes or no? More energy or less energy in your body? How many of you love to sing when no one's around? You're in your car, you're singing, you're rocking, you're rapping, and you're 70 and you're white and I'm confused. 
And you're sitting there, you're rocking out. You get to the stoplight, you're rocking out. You look at someone next to you in the car next to you, they're staring at you. What do you do? You quickly grab your phone, right? And act like you've been talking to somebody the whole time. <laughs> How many like to sing even though you sound terrible? How many like to sing you sound terrible? Why is that? Because emotion is created by motion. The more you move, the more you feel. We don't move much anymore. There are 47 different muscles in your face. For some people, this is the largest area of unemployment in the country, right?